Testing. Oh, wow. Everyone okay, definitely off. working. Great. Um, morning, everyone. Um, it's so great to see so many people um, for the very first session. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Shakia Stewart. I'm the Global Head of Content at the British Council, and I'm really delighted to be here today with Piers Linney, who is an entrepreneur, investor, ex-Dragon from Dragon's Den, and co-founder of Implement AI. So we will be delving into today, um, a, we're going to be looking at how AI is changing how businesses operate and engage with customers. And we're going to dig into how to really navigate and push forwards AI technology within your business. And particularly how to go about building a competitive AI assisted organization that can communicate, engage, deliver impactful experiences and retain customers using new capabilities. So we've got about 45 minutes this morning. We will welcome questions and comments at the end. There'll be a Q&A session. Um, so hold on to your thoughts and share that for the end. Um, and without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Piers. You can introduce a bit more about yourself and what we'll be looking at today. Hello, thanks for coming early. Um, so I'm Piers, as I said, I've been on TV, did all that stuff, but my other background, my other life is, my background is a lawyer, banker, uh, technology, media, telecoms entrepreneur, but about, Eight years ago, I was a trustee of the UK's largest innovation foundation called Nesta, about £600 million uh, foundation. And we did a lot of research about artificial intelligence, robotics, how it's going to affect the UK. And that kind of stuck with me. It's a lot of the keynotes I do. I'm always talking about futurology, technology, its impact on business, society, and, and the UK especially. And then obviously the last sort of year or so, probably the last six months especially, in terms of people's general understanding of it, you've seen this rise of generative AI. So myself, my co-founder, Alok, who's got a more of a machine learning background in medical um, and uh, sort of healthcare technology, we kind of got together and said, look, there's a lot of chat about chat GPT and bar, whatever the hell it is. They've got a lot of chat about large companies spending millions of pounds on building huge infrastructure, but there's nothing in the middle for SMEs. And the point is, I put one chart up, don't need to do slides, we put one slide up because the point is, and, and it's, it's quite hard to grasp it today because we're all human, and we don't, we struggle to understand exponential change, right? We, we evolved in, a, in an environment where you had a dog, a fire, a spear, that's kind of it, and nothing changed for millennia, essentially. Oh, I'm using this microphone now because that's not, not working. I think it just needs to be a bit louder. So okay, um, so needs. nothing changed for millennia. So we, we struggle to understand anything other than linear change. This chair is really annoying me. <laughs> Spinning around. I'll be facing that way in a minute. Uh, and when I was a banker and a, you know, an entrepreneur and an investor, you look at companies, right? And we've all done this. And you look at growth or decline, and it's 1%, 5%, 10%. You know, it's linear, isn't it? But our world is, it's going to change. It's going to change in, hopefully, if I keep looking after myself, my lifetime and uh, our lifetimes. And what's happening is, is that you know, we've had 250 years of you know the industrial revolution the first one the second industrial revolution there's more about sort of um mass production the third industrial revolution was really about digitization we've all kind of we've all grown up um experiencing that but the fourth industrial revolution is where we start moving from a world which is what i call what we call this is our kind of framework really human first there's augmenting humans often physically to, to get more done essentially we're now moving into a world where we're in the world today, which is what we called AI assisted. That's what we're going to talk about today, really. And eventually, which we're not going to talk about because we're not quite there yet, there'll be an AI first world. And you've got to think about an AI assisted organization a bit like an autonomous car, right? So cars initially, we, they started talking to you. It was rubbish. That'd be as good as chat GPT quite soon. But essentially, you had things where they'd stay in a lane. If you went over a line, your steering wheel would wobble and it helps you understand that. Eventually, you're going to be able to sit in the back, asleep, and there'll be no steering wheel. That's full autonomy. And organizations are going to be the same. There will come a time where technology is better, simpler, faster, cheaper, and safer. It will be unethical to use a human in most physical labor. And in terms of cognitive labor, which is what we all do, and knowledge work, it's not going to make a lot of sense to use humans for cognitive labor either. What we're going to have to do, if you think about it, our lives, is it's like a pyramid of value, right? Think, imagine a pyramid, and that pyramid was all humans. Human labor, cognitive labor, and that's been filled with technology. 
So we, all of us, including myself, we have to scramble to the top of that pyramid and keep adding more and more value. Now, that's not a negative. What that means is typically, if you look at the, you know, the technology for marketing event today, a lot of it's about automation. So what it means is that you, especially if you've got quite a small company, you can automate the mundane. A lot of that pyramid of stuff that we do is, is mundane, it's admin, it's repetitive. And what you want to do, what we all want to do, is focus on what's more meaningful. It's that piece at the top where you add more value, where you excite customers, you create amazing experiences, you, you hire people, you spend hours and money, a lot of money recruiting, bringing them into your business. You don't want them doing the mundane either. You want yourself and your team focusing on more meaningful work. They're happier, they're more likely to stay, and it gives you a competitive advantage. So at Implement AI, this is the new business, we essentially focus on helping SMEs understand artificial intelligence and how to implement it in your business today. Now, we start with sort of consulting to helping you understand what are the workflows you can automate, how do you use it, and often sometimes, you're gonna see now in Google Duet, you can see uh, Microsoft Copilot's coming out in November. So in all these big company productivity suites that we all use, you're gonna be faced with a prompt you're going to help, we help generate content, be it PowerPoint if you're in Microsoft Stack, um, Excel even, you can talk to the spreadsheets now, Word. That writer's block moment has gone forever. So initially, your competitive advantage is going to be using that technology better, understanding it and knowing how to extract the most value from it. Because essentially, eventually, it'll be like spell check, right? We're all going to have it. There'll be no differentiation. And when we implement I, we look at your business and say, Right, okay, everyone's got spell check. You know, we do some training to optimize your capability, but then what we do in, in larger companies is say, look, and by that I mean companies with not startups, people with products and, and, and revenue, we say, look, how, how do you create an unfair advantage? I might speak, I've gone off here. How do you create an unfair advantage? And that's about looking at workflows and beginning to automate them. So if you imagine your payroll, which might just be you, it could be up to you know, 50, 100. Some of our clients have got 500 staff. You're looking at your payroll, and imagine that over time, lots of those tasks and those roles, is it still working? Lots of those tasks and roles, they become augmented. So you augment your people, yourself, you scale yourselves up, you level yourselves up, and then over time, you'll find that some roles, now we're not kind of saying get rid of everyone that works for you, it doesn't really work, but as you begin to grow, what you don't want to do is add cost. So what happens is as you grow, your revenue grows, your costs don't. They're always going to grow, right? But not as quickly as they used to because you don't need to hire as many people. And what that means is, is that your margin expands. And the, people, the thing people often forget is that we had one company in financial services, uh, three million of revenue. It's not a huge company, but you know, quite a decent sized business. And we, can, we've, we think that, and we call it the augmented AI assisted PL, we can generate another 10% on the bottom line. Now, he thinks his company's worth 10 times that. So if you look at 3 million, he's got another 10%. That's quite a lot on your bottom line. Think about the margin. Think about the value of that. That's another 3 million pounds in personal wealth you've generated. Because one day they want to sell that business. So what we're talking about today really is becoming, how do you become AI assisted? This is not binary. This is a journey because the more you em embed and use AI in your business, this technology is changing. I, mean, I do it every day, right? I, I get tired trying to keep up with it. I know how everyone else try, even tries to do it. But over time, the technology is moving very, very quickly. I mean, ChatGPT announced yesterday, can now see, you can show it things. So you can't just talk to it, and now you can talk to it. And eventually, the AI will have all of our senses. So now it's got speech, you can communicate verbally, and we're going to a world very quickly within the next two or three years where we can talk to technology. It's coming in Alexa, it's coming in Google Home, it's coming in your car. And now we can converse in natural language with technology. I hate to say it, but a lot of the people in this room are gonna be disrupted because one of the pains in my life as an investor is I've got an, oh, an entrepreneur, these days I'm more of an entrepreneur than an investor, which is not a good thing sometimes, but is that I wanna, I've got an objective, right? So I've got a plan, a requirements, and I've got to write a lot of code to make it happen. I've got to hire tech, tech teams, 
a QA and a te TA, technical analyst, business analyst, developers, QA, the lot, testing. It's, it's 10, 15 people to get anything done. In the not too distant future, you will talk to technology. You will say, here is my objective. And that will then just write the code and make it happen. You'll see the outcome and say, that's not quite right. You'll talk to it, iterate it. So the days of code being something we all have to deal with are coming to an end. Your, your, your creativity, your objectives, you're very quickly going to be able to focus on that top of the pyramid, that's what I'm talking about, rather than worrying about it is the code work. And that's going to empower all of us. It's also going to disrupt a lot of businesses. So I think a lot of software to service companies, oh, you'll get a word in in a minute, a lot of the software service companies, they, um, they're going to be disrupted because a lot of the technology now has been built into these models. So the future is AI first. That's five years out for probably knowledge work, 10 years out for robotics and physical work. But today we're AI assisted. So how do you transition from where you are today into being optimized using this technology? Do you want to speak? Oh, sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> That's the perfect segue. I was going to say, let's, what I'd really like to do is get into exactly what you're saying now. How do you transition from zero AI to AI assisted? Yeah. And what does that mean? This keeps going on. Um, um, but, but particularly, one of the things that you mentioned was that kind of upskilling capabilities and, and the people piece of work that's really important, but how do you kind of navigate that with the speed of change? So how are we going to be training people quick enough? And then if you could also... No. Thank Excellent. you. If you could Two also mics. touch on the number of platforms out there, you mentioned a couple already, you know, Microsoft, Pilot, Google, how do you How do you even start to choose what works best for your organization? And then that is a challenge. There's like a huge amount of noise, um, platforms, software as a service companies, everyone's got the product flipping AI. discovery process. It's like dot coms now. Uh, you put AI, you change your domain name from dot com to AI. Um, so there's a lot of noise. And what we focus on implementing AI is, is AI for business. So we have a podcast. Please subscribe, listen to our podcast, weekly podcast about how do you implement AI in a business? We basically answer that question. And as I was saying before, this is not a, it's not binary, it's not a destination. You don't turn it on and then you turn it off. It's not one project. You're going to evolve with the technology. But the first things really are is that you've got to take everyone with you. So it might be just you. It can be five of you, 50 of you, 500 of you. And the first really is understand, have policies and a framework in place. Work out you know, what the four corners of the box are for you and your team so you all know what you're playing with because some of this stuff is quite powerful and you don't want people sort of going off piece. If you're a regulated business, very important to know where your data is. Where's your customer data going? Um, that, can be, that can be catastrophic if that goes wrong. So one is have a policy and a framework. Next thing then really is to look at your team and look at look. Where are they today? How can I augment them? How can I AI assist my team? And what are the, what's a low hanging fruit? So with our clients, we have a thing called AI Activate. It's like a 60 day sprint. And we talk to them and say, right, let's talk for your business. Let's talk for the workflows. How can we optimize you first with training? So, you know, Let's take a prompt engineering, right? You all heard of prompt engineering. So chat GPT, people go, write me a book about cats, right? You're, well, I say, use Claude. Claude's much better for longer documents. Write me a book about cats in Claude Pro. You can write me a book about, it'll be rubbish, generic nonsense. So what you don't want, if you're a marketeer as well, is generic nonsense. It's all about context. If you put a Harry Potter book in, apart from the last sentence in Harry Potter book, and ask that LLM, what's the last sentence going to be? Because it's got a huge amount of context, it's probably going to be pretty accurate. So training is really important, number one, that's what we do. And then it's about look at your workflows. What can I automate? And the key is here, we're all in business, what's the return on investment? There's no point automating something, right? Like designing a robot that can go out to Starbucks and get you a coffee. It's pointless. It's cost you an absolute fortune and it's not adding any value. So what are the workflows where we can automate it and add the most value? And to what extent can we all automate it? You can't automate everything. And at what point then, what you also don't want is humans involved and technology. Then you've got two costs. So look at your workflows, low hanging fruit, what can we automate quickly? And that's where you start. And over time, you understand it, you see how it works, you understand the return on the investment, your stakeholders see it, and you take them on a journey, and you go through your business ticking them off.
Just a quick um, point on the kind of human resource element. There is obviously a lot of fear associated with the kind of rise of AI, with the generative AI that we've seen with ChatGPT and so on. So what do organizations and businesses need to do to ensure that their staff, when we're looking at augmenting their kind of, you know, with training and so on, how do we reassure people that this doesn't mean you're going to get replaced? This is actually going to mean you have more time to do the creative bits of work. Um, and the exciting bits of work. What, yeah. How do we make that happen? So I write a blog on LinkedIn on my website. It's called, uh, I want to call Fear, Uncertainty and Doubt, FUD. So FUD is where you have a new technology called S-curves, innovation curves, and technology takes off, it flatlines. Take cloud technology. I spent years in cloud with some success, sometimes not successful. And cloud technology came in. There was, oh, we can't use cloud technology. It's not safe. Where is it? Do we understand? But essentially and inevitably, new technologies, because there's a, a benefit to using them, they take off and the old technology dis disappears. Not completely, we've still got radios, you know, people still buying vinyl for God's sake. So new tech never quite completely disappears, but inevitably new tech takes over. And normally, in that, that period of fear, uncertainty of doubt, that argument, that can be in ele electricity, you know, we might see the nuclear fusion. That's going to be like 150, 200 years, 150 years. In cloud, people are still talking about transitioning into the cloud. And the point I'm making is this. There's a ship leaving the harbor, right? And this ship is going to start moving at exponential speed. And this technology, and you've already seen in six months where it's evolved to, and this is why I'm involved in, in AI. I kind of thought, do I invest in technology? Do I build software? Do I build a SaaS company? And I thought, no. In this kind of Californian gold rush equivalent, I want to sell shovels. I want to help people go and dig for that gold. And that's what we do. Um, but the point is that as that ship leaves the harbor, we can all make the leap. But there comes a point where that gap is too big to make the leap. Now, in all technology, you can sit on the quayside and one day think, all right, we'll do it now. Let's go to the cloud today, 10 years later. In this world, you can't do it. Once that ship's left the harbor and that gap's too big, we are all going to be left on the key side. And that could be your business, that could be your community, it could be a big parts of society. So, to answer your question, which I haven't actually done yet, FUD, and there's a great article by Andreessen Horowitz saying that we haven't quite worked out yet what our relationship is between AI and human resource. In our, in our world, Implement AI, we say that AI should be augmenting your human resource, scaling you up, leveling you up, becoming a time machine. Well, I found half a day. I write, you know, I'm writing stuff now, you take me a week in a half a day. So you've got a time machine, so use the tech to level people up. And you're saying to your colleagues, look, I'm gonna help you scale up, be more effective. You may need to change their comp plans if it's based on productivity because they're, they're starting to become much more productive. And then take them with you on the journey. There will inevitably be roles, there's no point hiding, that in five years will not exist. But there will be other roles, going back to that pyramid, where you've got to scramble up to the top and add more value, where there'll be much more meaningful roles. You know, repetitive roles, um, anything that's sort of sitting at a computer, talking to machines, inputting data, that is all going away. Content, the cost of content is going to zero. And if you read um, the guy who's uh, the founder of a uh, CEO, actually, of OpenAI, ChatGPT's um, business that made that, he writes a great blog on his website called Moore's Law of Everything. And Moore's Law is where transistors in technology every two years doubled in size. So exponential growth from a simple transistor to our silicon chips today. And you're going to see that Moore's Law be applied to almost everything we do. I don't know how I've managed this, but I'm now... I know, these, these chairs are mine. They're, I'm sitting looking that looking way, you. you're down there. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Thank you. So we've talked about, you've talked about policies and frameworks that you need in place. We've talked about the augmenting your workflows, your workforce. What needs to happen next? And yourself. And yourself. Scale yourself okay. up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And after you've done those things, you've, started, you've put policy in place, you've got a framework, you've started to implement training. What other things do you need to consider when you're trying to, get to create an AI-assisted organization well, so that's competitive. You've got a business to run, right? <laughs> so that's, that's what it's all about. So now you've, you've optimized yourself and your team with training. You've looked at some workflow, said, okay, let's automate that. And you've learned how to integrate this, implement it in your business. And then you, you learn what's your ROI. And then you find 
where does it really work in our business? And once you have that understanding, the only way, only way to do it is to try and actually do it, not talk about it. It's not about PowerPoint. And then you start to look at other workflows and work out, okay, what other ones can I tick off? And then you get to the point of, stop worrying about costs, right? Costs are exciting, you know, costs are great. They improve margin. We all want to reduce our costs. Then you start focusing on growth. So how do I then use this technology to grow? That's what we all want to do at the end of the day. We've all got different growth aspirations, you know, they can be different, but how do I grow? And the key is this, and you know, a lot of the time with AI, it can sound like you sort of scare factor fun, but I'm a big believer in this, is that you have to implement AI, remember this, if you take one thing away from this conversation today, it's this, you have to implement AI before your competition does. That's it, and I'm not gonna have to explain why. Okay, so I wanted to move on now to kind of how does this directly relate to marketing organizations? You, we could talk a little bit about hyper-personalization, for example, or the data insights that you know, AI can, can give your organization. If you could speak to that a little bit now, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, so th this kind of goes back to the beauty of marketing is, is it's partly cost and it's also growth. So you're, you're getting a double whammy, the best of both worlds. And you know, one is about you know, marketing, or sales and marketing, but more marketing today, is you can create very different customer experiences. So I'm now toying, um, I'm gonna set it up. So you've probably done this already, some of you, but on your website, you know, you can have somebody hits your website, they sign up for something, and usually they wait to get an email, a newsletter, whatever the hell it is. Now, you can send them a personalized video from me saying, hello, hello Shakir, uh, thank you for signing up. Um, great to have you on board. And it's me talking to you using your name. I have not, not made that video. That video is a standard video where I've inserted a field, a name, and when the video is produced by the software, it's changing the shape of my lips and it's making me say that name. You know, translation, you can now translate where not just to just change the, the language, it changes the shape of your lips. So your ability to reach people and to excite people and to create personalized experiences, and that's what it's all about really, about connecting with people, goes through the roof. Um, secondly, as I said before, a lot of content now is, a lot of marketing is content marketing. The cost of content is going to zero, right? That doesn't mean that that cheap content is going to be any good. You know, you have to be able, 80% of the work we used to do to create content, and I create content, uh, is, is going away. It's still top of the pyramid. It's the 20% of the top where you're going to add the value to differentiate. So the ability to, you know, a lot of these SaaS companies talk about sign up, we can, you know, handle your customers, CRMs, um, the sales automation. We're going to a world where I'm not talking to a persona anymore. And I'm going to get found out now by my marketing skills here. I'm not talking to a persona anymore. I'm talking to you. You know, my, my model, I think of most companies and SaaS businesses, and this is, this is why we develop AI agents. So most companies work on the bell curve, right? It's that shape. And we all want to hit the middle. The middle is where we get the most custom, the most bang for our buck. The edge cases are a pain in the ass for us. We don't want to deal with them. And software often doesn't. Now, you can deal with edge cases because you're not trying to optimize for the average person with the average communication in the average way on the average platform. You can now talk to edge cases personally and directly. Now, don't get me wrong, this software, this technology is evolving. It's not all quite there yet, but within 24 months, you'll be able to do that. And now, and I don't mean go and buy out some software. You can do this yourselves in many ways using available technology, things like Zapier, things like Make, where you can string these things together and create workflows yourself. It's all no code. You can string together your, your, your website to your email, to a um, automated video production platform, to communication, to sales automation. That's the beauty of it. You don't have to anymore buy software. And then the, the, the last phase with really, all of this is eventually you create AI agents. So AI agents, think of your payroll, think of AI agents being a virtual version of it. And over time, the agents help your payroll, but over time your AI agents become your payroll. I'd like to touch on a couple of things that you brought up there. So one of them is about this kind of hyper-personalization. Get up. <laughs> Move to this one. <laughs> okay, let's see. It's going to go down on me as well. There we go. 
Leveling up. Leveling up. Okay. Um, so one is about this hyper-personalization. Is there a danger? So, we, you know, there's this, this concept of the echo chamber. You know, if you're, you're, you tend to click on certain items when you're kind of looking for certain clothes or whatever, and then you get fed more of that. Is there a danger? How do people break through to, with new, different right. products? I've, I've got an interesting theory for that. So there will be a world in, you know, say, five years, well, let's face it, it's, we're going back to a spell check, right? Everybody knows that the marketing they're receiving is hyper-personalized to them. We all know it. We recognize it. It looks very clever. It's super talking to me, but I know how it's done, right? That doesn't change the fact that that experience is personalized and you're connecting. But my view is this, right? There's, a, there's, a, there's like a, a, a massive opportunity because of this. So large companies and small companies tend to work in different markets, you know? So your local fish and chip shop is not gonna start making jet engines like GE, right? That's an extreme example, but you get the idea. Now, what you've seen in AI, interestingly, is normally new technologies, going back to those S curves, but the early adopters are small companies, entrepreneurs, small businesses. They're more nimble, they're more flexible. They can move their little jet ski a lot faster. The big companies, the oil tankers, takes some years just to turn left. Now, what we're seeing though in artificial intelligence is that very large companies are spending millions, if not billions of pounds, trying to implement this technology because they see the existential risk as well as the opportunity. So the big companies now, the GEs of the world, can start coming after the edge cases, that long tail of customers that small businesses historically focused on. The other end of the equation, uh, the flip side is, small businesses now, you know, cloud help you do this, small businesses now can start going after much bigger customers. You can serve them. So big companies are, have always struggled with cost to manage, cost to acquire, cost to support small, bit, small businesses, edge cases, and small companies haven't had the technology to, to provide the service that they wanted to. Um, so you're gonna see a battle, what I call, the battle for the middle ground. And if you're a smaller business, not an enormous business, that is where you can create a huge amount of value. And I think that's where, that's where this is going to be win. What we don't want to end up is, you know, there's only two companies in the world that can do anything. So here I'm not talking about artificial general intelligence, you know, or machines walking over the crumpled remains of human warriors, that kind of nonsense. That's a long way away. But when that does happen, all, te all software, all technology, all SaaS goes away. You just talk to a computer and say, I want to get this done. It'll understand you like a human and just go and write the code or whatever it needs to do to get it done. That's coming, but that's probably 10, 20 years out. So just looking at the time, we've got about 15 minutes left. So I wonder if I can ask one more yeah, question actually, and then yeah. we'll do some I'd love to do Q&A, yeah. actually, yeah. Um, my question very quickly was just if you could touch on what kind of ethical... Um, considerations you need to think about when setting up that policy and framework in terms of you know diversity, inclusion, accessibility when we're yeah. starting to, to implement more AI technology in our organizations? So one is, I advise Sky on um, diversity and inclusion. Um, so you know, 30,000 employees. And we talk a lot about this. I was, on, I was doing a fireside chat yesterday, a panel. So there's two views on this. So let's talk about bias, right? You've all talked about, heard about bias. So large language models are trained on the internet. The internet's, you know, just pervaded with bias. And that's reflected in the way these things work. Now, you can train that out. So they're training out the bias in the models. But the beauty of this technology is this, is that we, there about a different, there's about 100 human biases that we all suffer from in different ways. So you can now engineer your bias, we've all got them, out of your decision making, out of your business. So when you're making decisions, when you're talking to technology and asking for advice, essentially, it's making optimized, quite cold, optimize decisions, not something colored by where you grew up or what your favorite color is. You know? So that, that's one thing that's really important. Second thing in your policies is the, is taking people with you. So as I said before, you're not replacing people. It will happen eventually. What our view is you want to grow without adding people. That's most of your cost. So what you're saying is what you want to do is scale you up and also level you up. You know, disability, I have to work a lot about disability with Sky as well. And Disabilities, a lot of disabilities unseen, you know. You can be dyslexic, you can be neurodiverse, not just physical disability. So I think that in a world where we're all competing for talent, becoming more and more competitive, people want to 
do something they enjoy doing and they want to do meaningful work. You can now recruit people. You may have, they may be cognitively impaired, we want to describe it, because the technology levels them up. And eventually, because of robots, that's probably 15, 20 years out, 15 years out, physical labor will also be leveled up as well. So the idea of disability goes away. So your ability now to reach out and hire people and much a much broader pool of talent um, is a fantastic opportunity. Okay, thank you. So thank I you. think now is a good time to go to the audience and see if there are any questions for peers. Must be a question. Chap at the back. Oh, uh, oh we've, we've got, got someone coming here. with the microphone. Don't worry, you can ask me a question about anything. Not even about this if you want. Ask okay. Me. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, like you said, there's a lot of noise out there. I was just wondering if there's any particular websites or places you go to to look to, to try and keep up to speed with the latest tech. Because obviously you could just go out there and there's loads of information on loads of different websites. Is there any particular ones that are good at, at kind of grabbing the latest trends? Um, no, there's a lot of them. So the, the ones to, well, listen, well, number one, I'm not actually joking. It sounds like I'm pushing it, but I am pushing it. Listen to our podcast, right? So we, we it's called the AI Assisted Organization. So go to implementai.io forward slash podcast. Every week, we talk about AI for business. Not AI about how do you make a cool rap track. You know, it's about AI for business. How do you implement it? How do you add value? And what about episode 17 now? It's quite a lot there. YouTube, so go for YouTube, and you'll find as you start looking at it, there are people that have, you normally know, can tell by their subscriber count and how quickly they're growing, how credible they are. But a lot of it really is to follow the CEOs of the big AI companies and read their blogs, because they have a lot of information that's coming out all the time. And most of the, even some we cover on our podcast, a lot of it is just breaking down those blogs and those announcements. So, you know, follow Shachi Nadella, follow, you know, Sam Altman, follow Emma, the, the Anthropic, follow all these CEOs. You'll get a lot of information from there. But the point really is don't worry too much about the noise because you can get, I do this all day, every day, right? And I struggle to keep up. So you, you've, got, you've got a day job. So try and, you know, listen to our podcast and follow the leaders. Just, just to add to that, it, it is just overwhelming yeah. what's out there and, and one of the things at, at my organization at the British Council that I personally found really useful is having working groups where and, and communities of practice so we've got you know a teams group where people are saying oh we've been trying this with, in, with our marketing um, a project over here or has anyone used this before just having those conversations with colleagues who are already trying things out and can share their experiences but then also having those bigger working groups because obviously you don't want to be going off piste and rogue you know, when you're yeah. thinking about customer data and all that kind of thing, you need to be working within the constraints of your of your business. Um, but I think, yeah, it, it's about having those conversations, listening to, to those podcasts, which I've listened to a couple of them, and are really fantastic as a kind of summary of what's out there. Um, and and trying not to get overwhelmed, which is yeah. which is quite there's difficult. There's lot, so we we started doing a little AI news, and it's, it's overwhelming, right? And every week you look and you kind of like the sixty things to talk about. We've got to pick five. So what we do now in our podcast is talk about the big news, like this week it was, you know, Microsoft Copilot's coming. That's quite big news. Um, so we cover things like that. And then what we then talk about in most of the podcast now is implementing AI in a, a small or medium-sized enterprise. So some of our clients are large enterprises, but more implementing AI in SME. So like this week, we were talking about policy, governance, and we just keep going through it, really. So, and, uh, you know, follow me. This is all I talk about these days. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? We've got one here. Thanks, hi. N knowledge on its own is a really dangerous thing. Yeah. So you, all of a sudden people understand biochemistry because of AI, for instance, and what that, what that can drive. How do you see ethics ultimately playing into that from an AI standpoint because where as human beings, it takes us a while to get knowledge, and with that knowledge, there's an ethical framework within within our societies that we live that sort of then guide our decision making. So that's my first point, and then my second one is, globally, different cultures and different societies have different ethical frameworks. How do you see that then playing into a, 
a sort of you're going to end up with a global set of different AIs, effectively, with different ethical, are, yeah. eth ethical frameworks. How do you see that playing out? And, and they're trained on different data sets. And that data set has their local, let's call it bias, or built into it. So I think ethics, there's two types of ethics. One is, let's call it macro ethics, right? So what are the macro ethics of, of us, all of us, no longer being gamefully employed, sitting at home, got to go fishing all day, because there's a, one AGI running the country. So that's not, I don't, we can't worry about that to some extent. That's who you vote for, right? But that's really important. We focus more on the ethics that you have some control over. I always say in business and life, don't worry about stuff you have no control over. So in, in, in your organization, ethics are really quite important, especially if you, with customer data. But I think that, going back to your other point, is that the beauty of technology is that it is dangerous because now you can become a doctor, right? Now, what you're going to see is maybe more regulations going to kick in. So we're now seeing in the US, there's been cases about um, um, regulating AI. The EU is talking about it. We'll probably follow that. So you're going to see it regulated to some extent. Regu the regulators are now focusing on this in various industries. But I honestly think that at some point in my lifetime, the regulators will be saying to us, to humans, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't go anywhere near it. Let the AI do it because we know it, it's, it's less fallible than humans. I mean, at the end of the day, autonomous cars now on accidents per thousand miles driven are safer than cars driven by humans. That's just the data. It's just that right now, they're not allowed out on the roads because if it kills somebody, it runs over a kid, all hell's going to break loose. But overall, they don't get drunk. You know, they, they, don't, they, they don't watch their phones or text their mates when they're driving. So ethics is the really... On the macro levels, I think you're going to see regulation try and cover it. The issue, I'm an ex-lawyer, right? The thing about regulation is it's always going to be normally 20 years behind society. In AI, you might find that it moves, starts moving so quickly, the regulators can't catch up. So then it's down to you and your organization and your own personal, personal brand, really, about how do we want to treat our people and our customers. And in a way, that's what can differentiate you. But over time, going back to the pyramid, um, we're going to be, we're, you're still going to see on, on our kind of, we have implemented AI, level zero to five, like autonomous cars. It's a long way, I think, before the human, we're all sat in the back of the car, sleep, and there's no steering wheel. There's still going to be a, a steering wheel in the car in the business for quite a long time where at some point, all of us still tweak it and make sure it's going in the right direction. Does that answer your question? I think um, that point about the, the, how regulation is, is so typically so far behind is really important and, and to take control of that within your own organization or business, you know, fill that stop gap. If, you, if regulation is not there for you, ensure you have a policy and framework for your staff and for your you, you customers. You can't wait. That in, you're, in, in this yeah. world, you've just got to, get, you've got to start doing it and you're only going to learn by doing it. So whether it's policy frameworks, um, training, uh, implementing technology, building your own AI agents to do, because again, soft, software as a service companies, like you know, your Salesforce, well, lots of companies here, they want to go over the largest, the largest market in that bell curve. You might be an edge case. So you can now use the technology and develop your own AI agents to run your business the way you want it run. Any other questions for us? I think we've got, we've got women here. Hi. Um, I work mainly in the hospitality space and hoteliers are very, very scared of AI because they see the potential of it removing people from their, what they deliver and obviously they see people as being at the core of their product. So, Piers, any advice as to what you would see as the low-hanging fruit to help them to start to work with it and realise it's potentially good yeah. in the long term? So, you know, low, low hanging, so anything which is repetitive um, is going to be automated, right? So anything that's booking systems, checking people in, it's all going to go away. But going back to that pyramid again, especially in hospitality, the top of that pyramid, actually, what you want to focus on is that human interaction. It's that engagement. It's that connection. And that's what you want. What you don't want to be doing is focusing on all the crap you have to do to get to that moment. So inevitably, in most sectors, listen, people talk about you know, admin assistants, checkout clerks, right? forklift truck drivers, Uber drivers. Right, fair enough. Lawyers, accountants, surgeons, it's coming for them as well, probably faster actually. And in the, in the creative economy, when I was at Nesta, where I first really got into learning about AI and robotics, the creatives were the safest. That's what the research showed. And what we're seeing with generative AI 
it came, kind of came for them first. So you don't really know. So the point is, I think, is that we've got to scramble top of that value pyramid and add the value. And hospitality, I think, is a perfect example. But inevitably, all that repetitive, mundane stuff will be and should be actually automated. That's going to impact work, job, society, you know, all that stuff. But this is inevitable. So going back to this thing here, you know, the thing about human nature is, wherever you are on that curve, you all think the future is going to be linear. You can't comprehend it's going to continue being exponential. But we're kind of here now, and this, this is inevitable. We don't quite know when or how. Is it two years, five years? But it, it's within our working lifetimes. Yeah, I don't think you can really underestimate the value of seeing someone face to face, you know, welcoming you to, to a, a, a place where you're eating or staying or that 20% that, that of human interaction. We, we crave that connection and that engagement and that's, that's never going to go away. A yeah, long way before a robot's changing a bed yeah. or cutting hair. It will happen one day, but that's a long way away. <laughs> Got time for one more question, I think. There's any other? Hi. Um, as an online business, um, AI is still a buzzword for us, what, what we need to do. do. Is there any standard framework available where we can have a starting point to start having discussions within the team uh, we have? So the, the key thing that is a good thing you notice, start having a discussion. Um, again, listen to what we talk about at our podcast, things like that. But start having a discussion. Now, if you're an online business, right, you've got to understand this. So what is the internet? So the internet is a collection of destinations scattered around this virtual space where, you know, you go into Google search, you look for something. I want a barbecue, right? It gives you a long list of flipping websites, sell barbecue. Some are there because they're sponsored. Some are SEO. Some are just there because they're there. It found them. I've got to go through them all and build my own list, whittle it down and make a decision. AI is going to change that. So the internet now, so essentially, there's going to be corporate, AI, corporate bots, AI agents, and we're all going to have our personal, if you said Iron Man, Jarvis. So you'll have an AI agent that knows you, what you like, what you don't like. It knows what your current heartbeat is. So I'm going to say to my AI agent, I want a barbecue. I've got 200 quid. I need it by Saturday, and I don't mind buying a second-hand one if it's a good one. The AI agent will take that information away. We'll then go and talk to corporate bots. So these corporate bots just have a product list, what they're willing to negotiate, the pricing, and, and uh, a way of paying, that's it. So the bot, your bot will go and talk to the corporate bots, come back to you and say, right, I found two Barbies, there's a new one, and the second hand, which one do you want? You go, I want that one. It'll go back to the corporate, but I'm not paying that. It'll go back to the corporate bot, negotiate, a little discount, because the bot knows what it can negotiate, do the deal, you get your barbecue. There is no internet in the middle. The internet is going away. So if you're an online business, you've got to think about how do you start to augment and change your business to understand and be part of that new reality because AI agents don't, are going to cut out all that hard work. This is why Google was slow to AI. And then once, once, that, once they realized this was happening and the kind of the dam broke, they're all over it because it completely disintermediates search. So in here, I know people talk about it, SEO, Remember I said this, is going away. Is that what you do? <laughs> Just check it. But, no, but there are other opportunities. But it's understanding it today and still having those conversations so you don't get caught out. I think it's understanding it today, but also having that curiosity and, and give, letting yourself be excited about what the change yeah, right, is I coming it, rather than excited. the fear yep. and, and kind of, you know, scariness. I, I tell you, I, I want to end on one point, right? I've been through, I'm old now, look, right? I've been through internet one, two, three, I think crypto, the lot. This is bigger than the internet was. We are living in, a, in an age, and you hear this a lot on the internet, and it sounds a bit hairy fairy, but I truly believe this as a bit of a boring historian, industrial revolutions. I grew up in a mill town in Lancashire. We are in an age now, that red dot there, where our world, especially for our children, is my kids run an AI summer school, believe it or not. Our world is going to change fundamentally and systemically forever within our working lives. And that is both, there are threats, existential threats, but there is enormous opportunity. And like we were just saying there, you, if you're not having the conversation now, you should be. You're not having the next 24 months, you're too late. 
And I'm not saying that to be you know, cool and on a frightening end point, but when that ship leaves the harbour, you want to be on it. Thank you very much. I think that's us for today. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for staying. Yeah, it's been brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.